All right, we're live. Welcome, welcome, everybody, to another Ubuntu Online Summit. I hope you all are watching us on summit.ubuntu.com. If for some reason you found this video and you're not there, you should go there. Uh, that's where all the excitement's going to happen. We're also in hash Ubuntu-UOS-plenary on Freenode IRC. But again, if you go to summit.ubuntu.com, that's all embedded there for you. All right, let me get my slides, and we will kick this off. All right, so this is the Ubuntu Online Summit for May 2015. Uh, what do we do in the Online Summit? For those who aren't familiar, this is our every six months get-together where we plan out what's going to happen in the next release. So the next release is coming in October. It is the Wiley Werewolf, and that gives us about six months to plan and implement and release everything that we want to get out in that release. And in addition to uh, planning the next one, we also spend some time this week showcasing what we've done in the last version, the Vivid Verbit. We put a lot of work into that. There's some cool new features uh, on the desktop, on the server, and of course on the phones. Uh, so we'll be showcasing some of that as well. The summit itself is split up into multiple sessions by topic. So you've got an app and scope development topic. You've got a cloud uh, core where we're going to talk about more of the, the underlying bits that are common across everything that uses Ubuntu. We have a new convergence topic this time around, which is obviously important to us, as we are going to one code base for all of our different devices. And of course, we've got a community track, as always, for anything related to Ubuntu community, community teams, and uh, growth and advocacy on that end. We also have a new show and tell track this time around, which is dedicated just to showing off things that are cool and interesting that you're working on. So we've got a bunch of demos on there that people are going to show, some walkthroughs where they'll teach you how to do certain things with Ubuntu, uh, tutorials to help you get set up and going with various stuff, and just general interesting things that uh, they like, they've worked on, and they want to show off to you. So go and check those out. Those are going to be some interesting things. Every one of these tracks has multiple track leads. They're a combination of people from Canonical and people from the community, and they are there to help you. They can get you set up with a, a session. If you're hosting a session, they can walk you through that. If you are just participating, they can uh, tell you what you need to do to participate effectively. If you have any technical issues with the schedule or with the Summit website, go find one of those. They are listed on uh, the website itself, summit.ubuntu.com slash uos-1505 slash tracks. So that link right down there at the bottom of the slide. That will list everybody by track who you can contact uh, to get any help that you need. The online summit is a community event. We do this for you as much as for us, and we want you to be involved in it as much as we are. So the first thing that you should do is you should register in summit. If you go to summit.ubuntu.com, you'll see a big register link there. That tells us that you're not only participating, but it lets you build your own schedule, too. So you can go through the list of sessions that are coming up. You can mark the ones that you're interested in attending. And then you'll get a nice view of your personal schedule so that you always know, you know what you wanted to attend in the next hour. You don't have to go back to the schedule and browse through and try and figure that out. So if you want to take a few minutes after uh, this plenary is done and go through the schedule and mark your sessions that you want to attend, that would be a good use of your time. Um, promote any sessions that you think are interesting. The more people that we have viewing them and participating in them, the more useful they're going to be to everybody. So if there's something that you're interested in and you plan on attending, go ahead and promote that on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google+, wherever you want to, uh, to get more people involved in that. And most importantly is we really want you to join these conversations. This is not just something for you to come and watch and you listen to and not be a part of. We want you to be involved in the discussion. We want to get your thoughts and your opinions. If you've got an idea of a better way to implement something that nobody's talking about, bring it up and explain it. And most importantly, we want you to take work items out of this. Ubuntu is a community developed distro. That means we need community people to be working on it also. If you are new, uh, don't worry. There's a lot of small tasks that you can do. Almost every session has something really easy like email somebody or create a wiki page, things that don't really require any experience or a whole lot of technical skills to do. 
but they're important things to get done. So take a work item for one of those. It's a great way to start getting involved in uh, helping Ubuntu. I've mentioned the Summit website a couple of times. This is the main tool for the online summit. Everything that we do is going to happen here. Um, you'll see at the bottom that we've got links where you can view the schedule by date, by track, or even by room. Every room is going to correspond to an IRC channel. They will be embedded inside the Summit webpage, but if you have your own IRC client you want to use, you can use that too. They're all on uh, Freenode. Once you go into the schedule, you'll see a nice list of what's coming up separated out by hour. Every track has its own code or color code, so you'll see the different colors on the schedule. You can easily pick out the ones that you're interested in that way. Uh, if you've set up a meeting that you want to go to, uh, you'll see a little yellow star next to it also on this view. You'll also notice a QR code up in the corner that will take you to a mobile version of the website, so if you want to scan that with your phone and have that easily accessible that way, you can also. Once you go into a session page like this one, uh, you'll see on all of them there's an embedded YouTube video that will play the video stream. Right below that there is an embedded IRC widget which will take you directly to the correct IRC channel for this. And then on the side we've got an embedded Etherpad page. This is an online group, editing, or group editor that we use to take notes uh, around questions, solutions, work items. It's really helpful to have somebody in there taking notes while other people are discussing because a lot of times when you're in the middle of a conversation you don't think, okay, we need to stop and write that down. So again, even if you're not participating in the discussion, if you want to take notes in this Etherpad document, that would be extremely helpful also. If you are running a session, uh, it's really easy to do. Uh, all you have to do is uh, show up a little bit early, go to uh, Google Plus Hangouts page. There's a link on the wiki, wiki.ubuntu.com slash UDS, that will walk you through this. Uh, you set up your online, or you set up your on-air Hangout, you get the Hangout and the YouTube URLs, you put them into Summit. Once you start running the session, it's important to keep an eye on IRC. A lot of people can't join the video Hangout or aren't comfortable joining the video Hangout, so IRC is going to be their main method of uh, participating in your session, so make sure you keep an eye on that. If people are asking questions in there, be sure to answer them uh, on the video and also on IRC. And just make sure that they feel as engaged as uh, anybody who's on the video also. And encourage participation from everybody, too. A lot of people are shy. They don't necessarily want to join in right away. But if uh, you ask them their thoughts and opinions, you try and get them to, to join the conversation, people will open up and get more involved that way. And that makes everything better uh, for the session and for the work that gets done afterwards. And again, if you need any help while you're setting up these sessions, uh, something's not working, you have a question about how to do it, go find one of those track leads and they will be able to explain it to you and uh, help you out. If you are not running a session but you are participating, there's also some things that you need to do. Uh, I mentioned before this is not just for spectators. We don't want you to just sit around and uh, have a one-way stream of information coming from us to you. We want to get information from you also. We want your involvement. So in addition to watching the video, make sure that you do join that IRC channel and the conversations that are going on uh, on there. If you feel comfortable with it and you have something to add to the conversation, then join the Hangout also. It's a lot easier to talk directly uh, to other people on the video than it is to go back and forth between video and IRC. Uh, engage with the presenters. The biggest fear most presenters have is that they're going to go in there and nobody's going to talk to them. So make sure you're talking to them uh, you're asking them questions, you're giving them your thoughts and opinions. It really helps everything move along. Again, take notes in the Etherpad. This is going to be kind of our permanent uh, record of what needs to be done after these three days. So note everything down in there so it doesn't get forgotten. And of course, most importantly, volunteer for some work items. Again, it's a great way to get started in Ubuntu. It's very rewarding. We have some key sessions uh, going on. We've got this one right now, the uh, opening plenary, uh, which you should all be watching. Uh, tomorrow at 1700 UTC, we've got the canonical CEO, Jane Silver, coming on to do a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions about uh, Canonical as a company or uh, how Canonical works with Ubuntu and the rest of the open source community, that would be a good time to come and bring those questions and ask her directly. And then at the end of Thursday, the end of UOS, we've got a 
plenary of track summaries where we go and give an overview of the highlights from the previous three days for each track. This is really helpful so you can go back and decide, okay, these are the sessions I missed that sound interesting. I want to go back and see what actually happened with those. In addition to those plenaries, we've got a whole bunch of Q&A sessions going on these next three days that you might want to be involved in. Uh, the community team has a Q&A that's happening later today at 1800 UTC. Uh, tomorrow we've got scopes Q&A where you can learn about writing scopes and uh, the, the details around what you need to do that. And also a Juju Charms Q&A on office hours if you're interested in writing charms for the cloud. There will be people there who can help you with that. On Thursday we've got a Ubuntu client Q&A where we're going to be taking any questions involving the desktop or the phone and how we're going to converge those two together. So that's at 1400 UTC. After that, there's an SDK team PPA for any app developers who want to pick the brains of the guys who are making the tools and the APIs that you use. We have a community council Q&A later in the day. So if you have any questions for the main governance body of Ubuntu, you can come there and ask that. And then finally, we've got a Snappy Q&A. Snappy is a pretty new thing. I know a lot of people have questions on that. That's a good time to go get it answered. That's a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's a lot of sessions going on. UOS can be kind of a, a stressful, very fast-paced time. So do try and relax. You don't have to get to all of these sessions. Uh, it's not like Pokemon. You don't got to catch them all. All of the videos are going to be recorded. You can go back to the Summit web page at any time and re-watch the video. The IRC is recorded. Uh, it's on irclogs.ubuntu.com. So if there's any links or details that are posted into IRC, those are going to be available for you also to go back and get that. And then again, the Etherpad's permanent thing. So anything that gets written down in the Etherpads is going to be around forever to, for you to come back and get to. So that's uh, the basics of how to participate this week. Uh, the most important thing, again, though, is you making this happen. However involved you are is going to affect the value that you get out of this. And the more people who are involved, the more value everyone's going to get out of it. So be active, be involved, be engaged. Uh, help us promote it. All right, and that's it from me. So now I will stop screen sharing and I will hand it over to Rick Spencer, who's going to give the actual uh, opening keynotes for us, along with uh, Alexander Sack, Ali, and Robbie. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm going to continue the uh, tradition of just saying some personal, sharing some personal thoughts that I have about Ubuntu, what we just accomplished, where we're going. But this time, I'm going to leave the setting the stage for the next six months to some other folks. So I just have a few quick things to share. So let me turn on screen sharing. OK. So um, first, uh, wow, we just, we just got this guy out, the 1504. So I think part of the Ubuntu Online Summit is that we like to celebrate what just came before, what we just accomplished. Uh, some of you may know that I actually have a soft spot in my heart for monkeys. Um, I've always just found them inherently amusing and endearing. Uh, so that made this a, a particular coincidence that made this a particularly nice release for me on uh, the desktop and uh, other areas. But on a more serious note, it was really things like this that made 1504 uh, a great experience. So seeing the different communities form uh, or continue their existing work, uh, this is really a shout out to Ubuntu Mate, who uh, joined as an official flavor, realized their vision within the Ubuntu community, brought in uh, new users, and this is always just uh, a really great part of using, working in Ubuntu. This is what keeps me coming back, release after release, is getting to, uh, to, to share with people who are participating in the community and people who are realizing their vision within Ubuntu. But of course, uh, anyone who follows me knows that releasing the phone was a big, 
big thing for me. I don't know if everyone knows. I've actually been dog fooding Ubuntu as my only phone since the spring of 2013. So when we turned around and shipped real phones with Ubuntu pre-installed to, uh, to real like end users, people who bought those phones, it was a really uh, uh, an amazing time for me and a lot of people. Uh, first of all, I think like BQ was an amazing company to work with through this. They were like a great partner to us, great feedback. But make no mistake, there is no way that the phone would have shipped if we weren't a community open source distro. There's simply no way. And it's, it's just numerically factual. And so there's a couple points that I picked out where I could talk about that. But working with the community to ship this phone was just incredibly delightful. So one area where you can see the, the, um, that it was a community open source distro was on the core apps project. Not everyone knows, but a lot of the apps that pre-installed, come pre-installed on the phone were written by community members. In fact, as you can see, there's like 150 people who contributed to the 10 apps that come pre-installed on the phone. And there was about 15 people who are just there month after month, week after week, uh, working on the code, writing the tests, giving feedback to the SDK team, updating the code, working with design to like iterate on the experience over and over again. This is one of the, the nicest group of people that I've ever worked with. I've met them not just online, I've met a few of them in person, and this has been uh, really enriching uh, to get to work with this sort of new emergent community. On the flip side, Another great example is in translation. So Ubuntu has always had a very, uh, I'd say, passionate translations community and making Ubuntu available in all different languages. So the phone came out and was in uh, 35 languages. Like what new platform can come out and have be translated into 35 languages? Only a platform with uh, engaged and active community. So they were there like month after month, week after week, doing the translations. And in fact, as we got you know close to ship, it's crunch time, let's get this out. Some of them, like people in the translations community would stay up like overnight to make sure that the translations got in before we shipped off images. Um, so I think uh, there's just too many people, like if I wanted to talk about everybody who contributed in different ways that need 10 of these slides, uh, 100 of these slides. There's people who, who wrote promotional material, people who logged bugs, people who fixed bugs, people who um, promoted Ubuntu uh, personally in different ways, people who were insiders, uh, everything you can think of to get us to uh, where we were today, to where we'll be able to ship, and to get us to this milestone. So, and uh, next, I think the next milestone, I'm really looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing what we do there. And I think that's actually a good segue to hand over to Alexander to talk about the uh, next six months in Snappy. Thank you, Rick. So, um, for those guys who, who don't know me, I'm Alexander Sack, and I've actually been around for quite a while in the Winter Project. I joined in 2007 when there was only a desktop um, there, only in some sense. It was super popular, and I joined as a Firefox maintainer, but then I went kind of all over the place at those times doing middleware stuff like Network Manager, Bluetooth, and um, later went on and worked on on the mobile front to make Ubuntu a great distribution for ARM devices and then went off and worked actually with, with Linaro and learned a lot about other worlds that are um, outside of the Ubuntu scope, in particular about Android. Um, and when I came back um, in the role to lead the Ubuntu core engineering efforts, there was a phone was basically in full fledged going onwards and um, I helped basically getting the base system going. 
what I found very good all, all, those, all, all those times was that Ubuntu was never really stuck in, in one situation. The desktop was super popular, but at the same time, while I was basically participating in the Ubuntu project, we saw the server project coming along. We saw it become super popular in the cloud, both as a guest, but also as a host system. And then we had the ARM community, that base, uh, the ARM port, which basically made it only possible to, for us to create this amazing phone community that we see nowadays. And um, as, as excited as I was to see all that is growing, I believe that with Ubuntu Core and Snappy in particular, we really have um, the next big step of Ubuntu in front of us. And I would like to use this opportunity to explain um, to you how, what that is, how we got here, and um, why I think why I'm so excited about this. So, what is the Snappy thing? So. As a background, when we basically went back and we were looking at new opportunities, which we regularly do, we were looking at the IoT market. And when we were looking around there, we saw that there was so much innovative energy out there that were people building devices based on Linux in an open manner. And they were building things like robots, they were building home hubs, they were building switches. So not only constrained to IoT devices. And we found that many of those were actually using Ubuntu already. Um, and that was very striking and eye-opening. And we basically then took a step back and looked at um, what they were doing and why they were loving it. And we found out that they, they had a great place to work with, had great development environments, lots of great open source um, software that just worked and that was nicely integrated. And not only for x86, but also for ARM. At the same time, we had the phone and we were basically have gone through the process to understand what does it really mean to do an end user device that can be productized and that can be rolled to millions of users. And we also learned that these, this work isn't that easy. I mean, getting from a distribution that is great and has good software archives to get to something where you can make a custom appliance that end consumer can consume, that you can update and that can have apps that can be distributed freely through a store in a secure manner was quite a significant investment we had to do. And when we combined that with what we have seen on the, um, on the front of devices and innovators that were using Ubuntu to build great prototypes, we thought, let's see if we can distill all that, um, all that together and come, come out with the very basics that are needed so that everybody could do something like we did on the phone. And that's basically what Snappy and Ubuntu Core is about, really getting those tools and those practices that we have learned on the phone and combine that with all the goodness we have with Ubuntu so that everybody out there can go and make their innovative idea around devices and IoT a reality. So let me share uh, my slides with you and then talk through a few things there. Right. So the title, I mean, is basically Mark made made up this word, a Linux firmware. So in the end, Ubuntu Core is very minimal, and it really is a read-only system that comes with those abilities that are needed for people to build um, their great innovative ideas in the form of applications. And this basically expands the reach of Ubuntu now, not only for humans or the cloud, but we will go for devices and for robots with this. So. In the past year, we have been working on this vision, and I think we have come to a point where we really put something amazing together, and that concluded with, concluded with the release of Snappy Ubuntu for 15.04, which obviously isn't a perfect thing, but what we were trying to shoot for was really to get all the primitives in that are needed to, um, to deliver the story that I was trying to explain, that there is an easy building block system that people can use to deliver um, their own device innovation on top of it. So what is in 1504? We really put together a platform that is apps and store um, ecosystem enabled. So everybody who starts with Snappy Ubuntu Core, they can directly go and make use of those nice facilities that make up modern devices. It has built transactional updates and rollbacks in as primitives at the ground. So that is basically the basis that is needed for anybody who wants to roll large scale um, products to market and wants to ensure that those devices in the hand of customers can stay secure without risking to break them. Um, we had security sandboxes for apps and frameworks in this release in a very generic and reusable fashion. So we took the technology we had developed on the phone and made it available so everybody who's trying to build 
any kind of those kind of devices can benefit from that and they can have an app store um, where third parties can more or less without review upload their applications directly and make them available to the users without a middleman, without having to go through um, a packaging process and so on. We also um, untangled the board support from the stack, I think Mark explained it, if you're an innovator and you want to have, have a great idea on devices, you usually have to go through the, all the stages of everything of your operating system. You have to make your kernel, you have to make an operating system, you have to invent the tools and so on. But in the end then, when you almost run out of money, you can finally get to the point where you can really implement your vision, and which is usually in the app uh, on the app level where your real logic is and where your real value is. So we managed to we try to um, untangle the board support from the stack so that people can contribute that independently and that innovators that want to build devices can pick that and, um, and use it. And last but not least, we really got together and it was um, really tough to get to the point that we have what I call a device builder ready um, state. That means we have all the building blocks together that some people can describe or that you can describe in something we called um, a gadget snap. Um, the, your device, what do you put on it, how do you configure the parts and pieces and make it reproducible, available for everyone. So let's take a look at what that means um, and, and how this, I mean, how this architecture looks like. I don't want to go into detail here, but I want to quickly step through the parts that make up the Snappy system and show you how I use that as part of our release process to make a nice demo of how to build an appliance with it. So if you look on the left side of this, um, this screen, you basically see that at the bottom there is a kernel part. This is independent. Um, we maintain a few kernels in, in the archive and make it available for the whole ecosystem. But this part is super easy to package and people who have a board and who want to allow hackers to make use of the development platform can also make that available to the community. On top you see something in the snappy world that we call an OS part, an OS snap. That's basically Ubuntu core. That's where basically the logic sits that gets and that glues all the whole stack together. This includes the snappy tool itself. This includes um, the init service like system D. It includes um, app armor. It includes debuffs and a few other very useful tools, but we don't put too, too many things into that because we allow everyone to um, extend the stack by adding apps and frameworks on top of it. And on the right, the green thing you say is basically something we call the gadget snaps. That's the place I was talking about where everybody can go and define how an appliance is really composed and how the individual parts are configured. So that you get, if you're a system builder, you would do this part, you get to something like on the right side where we have um, a guide up on the website that shows how you can use all those primitives and individual parts to build your own appliance. And we basically um, looked at it and made something very simple, which is a webcam demo appliance. It doesn't do much, but it shows you how you can construct from scratch something like that, make it reproducible, and ensure that the permissions um, go um, for accessing the camera will go through the sandbox to the webcam demo app. I highly recommend for you guys, if you're interested in um, doing this, to look at this guide, go through it, and let us know how you like it. Right, so that's what we achieved so far. So I want to talk a few minutes about what is coming next, and in particular, what are we, what are, what are the highlights and the topics we are going after for the 16.04 release, which is one year ahead. So I, it is not super detailed, and I'm not going to details because we work in a pretty agile, pretty agile way. But we have been um, thinking, have been thinking and looking at the backlogs, and have distilled a few items that we should focus on in the next few months and the year. So first, if you have seen the picture um, of the architecture, the snappy building blocks that are that are outlined there, those are not yet all fully snappified in the sense that there are snaps that are available in the store and that they are all using the same mechanism. In particular, the kernel and the OS are not done in that way. So that's that's a priority where to clean everything up to ensure that we deliver a consistent story there across the whole stack and ensure that everything can be delivered through the store on this front. The other big thing is transactional updates. So we've gotten to a point that all the parts we have can be transactionally updated and rolled back. 
But now we have to make use of those primitives to ensure that this can be super useful for product builders. The key words or the buzzwords we want to ensure are really present there for everyone in the ecosystem who is working on snappy um, parts or snaps um, or whole systems are basically canary updates and the ability to include health checks in your snaps. This is a pretty powerful tool combined if you think about it because every part can basically test themselves if they're okay, if they can run properly and otherwise trigger a rollback. If you pair that together with doing canary style updates, meaning that you have the, uh, have the tools available that allow you, if you want to do a new version rollout of your application or the system, to first give it to a few people that are using your application instead of everyone. This can be a very powerful tool, especially because the health checks will ensure that things roll back automatically. So that's pretty exciting. Another thing is the user experience. We have gone through um, pretty big exercises to create a very crisp and clean command line experience. I'm sure if you have logged into a Snappy system, you might feel that the Snappy tool itself is very nice to use. However, we have been looking at that, and I think uh, we can do more. A, we want to ensure that the entry point of a system is not the shell as at the moment, but it's something like a snappy shell that gives you really just the primitives that you need to really control your snappy system. In turn, we want to bring the comfy feeling back. That means bring something very easy for you to consume into the snappy ecosystem that will give you back the full Ubuntu experience that you're, in, that you're used to from the server and command line. How we really realize it, we don't know yet, but I think there will be some discussion during this week on this topic, so look out for that. Another big topic for the next coming months and the year is definitely the developer experience. So far, we've been focusing mostly on the runtime side, so how does the snappy system, how is it constructed, how does it feel when you use it, but we haven't really looked at how do we make it very convenient for the whole world of um, developers to make use of it and to publish their apps very easily. In general, snaps are very easy to package, so in theory you just put everything into one tree that you need to run it, you bundle all the libraries that are not on the snappy um, OS part itself, and then you package it up and everything should go. But in practice, it can be pretty tricky, and I think we have a one-time opportunity to really ensure that everybody who is working um, on open source software or also commercial software can do so very easily. What we envision to do there is to create a tool called Snapcraft. This tool will basically allow you to, um, to compose um, or to, to do reproducible builds of your software and it will include plugins that allow everybody who um, is already engaged in, in a particular build system or open source community to um, make use of that easily. So the goal is not to reinvent a new packaging tool as we did in Debian, but rather ensure that we have something that can be extended so that people or that the community is working on PyPy and Node.js um, and these kind of words can use their normal tools to develop apps and brings it very easily to the Snappy ecosystem. Um, another important point for the coming months is to strengthen the hardware support that can be contributed by the community. So we have at the moment the ability for everyone to do a kernel snap and to make it available somewhere, but it wouldn't really be good if we had like a central database that would allow everybody to publish their, their, their enablement so that people can start hacking on whatever platform they find right away. Um, we will look at that and see how we can make that very easy for people to um, access. And last but not least, obviously, the store. The store is the central point for um, everything around distribution, integration, and managing of Snappy parts in our Snappy ecosystem. Um, at the moment, you, you feel like it's more like just a place where you put apps, but in the future, we want to make this something far more powerful where you use this as you have to really distribute your software. You, you can control how to drive canary updates. You can potentially hook in your continuous integration infrastructure so um, you can see early if problems are somewhere down the road in one of the other snappy parts you are interested in. And we also want to ensure that the store provides the APIs that are needed for management software to plug in and control systems around the world. All right, so I hope um, I managed to get some excitement over to you, and um, we will have a, we have a few sessions on on the on the core track and also outside of the core track around Snappy this week. 
um, if you want to talk about something that isn't on there and um, want to have us a session schedule, feel free to talk to me in person or one of the core track leads and we try to make that happen for you. Also, if you want to engage with us, check out the Hess Schnappi channel on Freenode or subscribe to one of our mailing lists and obviously maybe check out the docs on developerboot.com slash Schnappi. All right. I think that's it. Um, I hand over to Oliver, I think. All righty. Well, thank you, Asik. Um, that was quite a lot of information, lots of news about Snappy. And you know, it, it's exciting times to be around in, in Ubuntu, um, seeing you know, how decisions we made years ago, controversial or not, you know, are actually now coming together to you know, enable us to do what we're currently presenting. Um, so this cycle, I'm leading the client effort, so that in includes the desktop, phone, tablet, convergence, and you know, as the large bucket, as the large umbrella. And so we just came back from a week in Malta where we set back and, and planned, you know, um, how we can apply Snappy, how we can incorporate Snappy as a technology. Um, and so there's some echo on the line. Um, and so that was a good time, right? Uh, because Snappy enabled us to, to spread Ubuntu out to way more devices. And so before I dive into what this means for the client side of Ubuntu, I just wanted to reflect real quick on, on one thing. Um, there's lots of innovation going on in Ubuntu right now. Um, with innovation comes change, and change sometimes is you know hard to digest. There's um, concerns, uh, rumors, um, and, and people just feel strange about it. And so I just wanted to highlight um, one important aspect, if I manage to screen share, which should be on now. Um, and so that is, you know, if you look at the press, and this is, you know, my my weak attempt of attack cloud, you see all those topics that, you know, um, are raised. Desktop next, we'll just blocked about it last week. Ubuntu Touch has been out, you know, and we've been working on that. That's the phone code base. There's questions around what, what 1604 will be like, you know, what does Snappy really mean to Ubuntu, and so on and so forth, you know, lots of curiosity. And the, the one point I really would like to stress is that regardless of what, what we do um, with those technologies, you know, the underlying source of all goodness is Ubuntu. And that is, <clears throat> you know, the sum of the archive, Debian packages, Debian in itself, um, you know, the cadence that Ubuntu provides, the levels of quality, um, and most importantly, the community that has been stressed so far already by Rick and ASIC and ours. Um, in the kickoff of the online summit, and so I think we just have to rem remember that that you know it's the sum of everything that we do collaboratively that that makes Ubuntu so such a strong, um, compelling um, distribution and offering, and then everything that we do, so Snappy and and Touch, is built on top of that strong foundation. So I think that's that's just a key message that was you know really important for me to get out um, to take some of the tension out. Um, <coughs> and and <coughs> hey, excuse me. Um, give you some perspective. Um, and I think Mark, you know, like the I'm I'm personally involved with um, Unity Eight, um, as some of you might know. And so Mark put it up nicely yesterday um, in one of the questions whether Unity Eight will be the default desktop in 16.04 or not. And he said, you know, let's let the community decide. And I think that's. That's just strong proof of, of what I was trying to outline again. Um, so for 15.10, um, on the client side of things, um, convergence has been and will be still like a big topic. And, and what does it really mean? Um, today we have the Ubuntu desktop, you know, the distribution, as you know it, as I'm running it on, on my laptops and computers, it's running it on your servers. Um, and then um, we have desktop next, something that, as I said earlier, Will was blogging about, which was our playground to um, put the technologies that we have developed for the phone onto desktop computers, laptops, um, see how how the technologies pan out, how it will scale, and how the architecture really you know um, holds up. And so I think we've been quite successful in in doing that. Um, 
we are very well aware of all the, the gaps that we have with regarding the user experience. Um, and so we have a team working on that um, to close those user experience gaps, you know, taking the, the shell from a phone to, to, to a tablet or a laptop is quite, you know, different use cases. So, um, you know, I hope we'll see improvements in supporting legacy apps. You know, we, at MWC, we demoed uh, LibreOffice running on ARM on the touch code base and doing some conversions by, you know, entering switching modes between the tablet mode and a desktop windowed mode. So I think, you know, we'll see way more improvements and progress there. Um, <coughs> then we will add one additional um, image um, that will incorporate, so that will be um, the next evolution, um, where we will incorporate Snappy as a technology. So we will take the whole Unity 8 stack, if you will, so Unity 8, Mir, and all the underlying components, and, you know, marry them together with Snappy. Um, that will then be the base platform for all the commercial products that Canonical is doing, so that we inherit all the goodness that ASIC just presented um, that Snappy is providing. Um, again, this is on top of, you know, the Ubuntu distribution. So any any press reports you might have read of uh, Ubuntu switching to Snap format, you know, not quite true. Um, and then um, general improvements on the shell. There's you know a couple of work items we have to do um, for phones. Mark already stole my thunder yesterday about the pocket desktop. So you have a phone, you have Unity 8 there, and then the ability to take the MWC demo that I was just talking about you know, into production and, and have it as a product out that, that users can actually use. Um, so taking it from a demo into you know, a product, I think that's that's one of the big focuses for this cycle. Um, we have tons of sessions planned in the convergence track um, in, in this online summit. So I would like to invite you to join all those sessions and participate, share your ideas, you know, bring up um, different views of how we could improve um, Ubuntu, how we could improve Unity 8, the whole client side of things. And, you know, just work with us and give us feedback. Um, the team and I will be there, you know, eager to hear your feedback. And then I think the culmination of that is a Q&A session on Thursday. I think it's at 1400 UTC, um, you know, where we will be answering all your questions regarding client. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. All right. Um, that's the end of the client update. Rick or Robbie, who wants to take over? I'll take over. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so hi, I'm uh, Robbie Williamson. I uh, may have, You may or may not know me. I've been around for a while, pretty much as long as Rick, <laughs> uh, mostly on the server and cloud side uh, recently. Uh, and I have the privilege of being the vice president of cloud and developer, uh, I'm sorry, cloud development and operations within Canonical. Uh, what does that mean? It's basically um, focus actually a little beyond cloud. I mean, cloud is important to us, don't get me wrong, but um, it's also more about, um, uh, let me see, I guess scale out workloads if you think about it. And, um, you know, what are scale out workloads? Or, you know, these complex deployments of applications across the compute can be either, you know, containers, uh, VMs, uh, and even bare metal. Uh, and that's really the focus of, of what we've done with Ubuntu Server over the last few years. Um, cloud is absolutely important, but it's, it's, it's more than just that. It's the workloads that are running in these clouds that are actually moving from, you know, public clouds to private clouds to, to bare metal um, to, to containers and VMs on these machines. Um, I, was, uh, I was talking to Rick before we started about how, you know, like five years ago we were, like, wrapping up, you know, 1004 LTS, which just went into life, and... Uh, uh, you know, we, I think for those of us, for you who are with us at UDS, we had them, you know, in, in person. We were in Brussels or actually La Hope, I think, which was like outside of Brussels, where it was like a great venue. But I think by the end of the week, the, the trees had turned to bars and we were ready to go home. Um, and we were headed into um, the 1010 release. And uh, Mark had made a, a very strong and, and, and pressed effort to get me to get us to release it on uh, 101010, uh, the first and probably last release we ever do on a Sunday. Um, so it was good times. <laughs> um, and, and at that time, it was, it was interesting because we released a video that I had kind of put together and, you know, had, had the, the, the Twisted Sister, We're Not Going to Take It music and kind of um, uh, attacked Microsoft and Windows as at the time that was what we were trying to do for, with, the, with the desktop um, 
Um, and looking back at it now where we've come you know, today, where Microsoft is honestly one of our best partners in the server space. And like, I'll go into that a little bit. But it's, it's funny how things can you know, really change in terms of, 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 of Ubuntu and, and kind of the focus. Um, so I guess this cycle, this, the, the, the track, if you notice, it's, it's, it's mostly focused around kind of some key areas some key technologies that uh, Mark kind of highlighted uh, in his keynote and then um, some, some additional ones that, that weren't really uh, highlighted as much that I wanted to cover really quickly. Um, number one being uh, OpenStack. Uh, you know, from the beginning, Ubuntu's been very, very tightly integrated and synced with OpenStack. We're very proud of that. Um, some, some of the founding members of OpenStack came from the Ubuntu community and are still involved in that, and, and I take a lot of pride in that. Um, the, 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 dev, the, dev, the dev and release process for OpenStack, you know, if you're familiar with it, six months cadence, they, they meet together in a summit at the beginning, um, they iteratively release throughout the, throughout the cycle, um, and it's, it's honestly you know, borrowed and, and, and modified from, from what they've learned from Ubuntu, which, which has worked so well over these last uh, 10 years or so. Um, um, 1504, which just released, has the latest Kilo release of OpenStack. Uh, uh, we're able to do that because of our tightly integrated release process and able to actually even, you know, OpenStack can release after Kilo. We can get those updates right into the release of 1504. Um, and then obviously our, our LTS support, you know, a lot of folks who run clouds want the long-term support. They, 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 need to, they need to stay on the OS longer than, than the, uh, the, the short cycle of, of a non-LTS. So the five years is, is much more desirable. Um, so we do a lot of work in maintaining the Ubuntu Cloud Archive, uh, we being canonical, um, such that you know you can use the latest and greatest OpenStack on a trusted release of, of, of your OS. So you don't have you know multiple moving parts there, and that, that's I think a contribution I'm very very proud of uh, you know that, that we've done for OpenStack. Um, and you know we we I think folks kind of forget about Launchpad. You know if you work in canonical you don't, but outside of it obviously. It, it, the, the use of it is, is obviously more focused on Ubuntu, but a Launchpad is still a leveraged resource for OpenStack development. Um, I'm pretty excited that they that they were able to get Git support into that. That's like a unicorn for us if you've been in Canonical for a while in terms of getting that feature and support in the, into Launchpad. Um, and then finally, some of the work that's done around the uh, OpenStack Integration Lab. Uh, a lot of uh, software and hardware vendors come to you know Canonical to get to ensure that to help us help them test their 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 product and how and that does it work with OpenStack now and as it you know iterates through the development process and we try to feed them back just reports and information so that they know when the new OpenStack releases any problems that they're going to face in terms of their uh, in terms of their product and, um, and the the feedback that we get from them is how valuable that is because of all the different moving parts of OpenStack all the different projects uh, the core projects the the the, the satellite projects and so forth, and, and having all those moving parts tested routinely, um, daily, uh, is, is a value that they get and that we're happy to provide. Um, the tracks this cycle, there's, a, I think, um, upcoming uh, sessions around what's new in terms of Kilo, 1504, um, specific uh, uh, tracks around technologies of OpenStack, but that are not obviously part of core OpenStack, like, such as MySQL, which we are you know, near and dear to our hearts. We've been around for a while. Um, some of the improvements are on that. Um, but if you look through the track, I think it, what you'll see is the predominance around uh, Charms and Juju, which is a, a, a you know, a pretty key uh, project for us within uh, the Ubuntu server community in Canonical as, as, as we focus on scale-out workloads. Um, Juju is critical, you know, not just to the cloud, um, but, you know, to our bare metal deployments, to pretty much everything we do because it's focused on orchestrating these, these, these complex workloads. And, Creating, it, making it easier for the user to do so. Um, uh, Juju rely runs, uh, you know, across of I said public clouds, private clouds, being OpenStack and bare metal. Uh, the bare metal obviously was driven through what we call metal as a service, which is mass, where we try to take your hardware and pull it together as a as a as, as the cloud would, right? So you you know, so you are actually being able to get the power of the cloud, but on the speed and the performance of bare metal. Um, I'm pretty pretty happy with the maturation of Mass over over the years. Um, it started out as just a, a you know a hacky project in a room where a bunch of server engineers were like, we need something to to control these machines, and now it's evolved to, you know, supporting tons of hardware, multiple OSs, not just Ubuntu, not just Linux. Um, um, it's being leveraged by institutions across you know banking, telecommunications, cloud hosting. It's 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 pretty amazing to see 
what that team has done and that project has done. And if you and if you if you need a, a tool to, to manage your, your your hardware and to uh, to install in any OS, it doesn't have, it's, it doesn't have to be Ubuntu. We 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 have people using it you know to install SUSE. You can install Windows. Um, I, I highly encourage you to take a look at it. Um, it's a project that I'm pretty proud of, um, and that that's it's pretty awesome to see you know how far it's come um, in terms of being able to manage hardware and and the way Juju integrates with that, being able to deploy not just clouds. You know, to us, cloud is just a scale out workload, but you can you know you can deploy any workload on these machines, be it you know Hadoop or or, or Ceph or Swift in terms of you know file system storage. So um, those two joined together are a pretty awesome combination, um, and that kind of does into you know dovetails into Juju. Um, and and I've been involved with that since you know very beginning um, when we were internally calling it Ensemble, um, and then you know we had this coming out party with Juju and Charms, and it's been pretty amazing a ride ever since. Um, and the maturation of not just Juju itself, but the community around it, and the focus around Charms. Um, if you've seen JujuCharms.com and, and the evolution of that, it's, it's freaking amazing. Um, the GUI itself and what you can do with that that website and how easy it makes it to deploy and manage workloads, um, it's, it's awesome. I, I highly encourage you to check that out. Um, you know, now we have support again for all the public clouds, uh, the major ones, some of the smaller ones, OpenStack, Bare Metal, and Mass. Um, you know, you, you can basically run. You have the freedom and flexibility if you of Ubuntu to run anywhere you want, anytime you want, any way you want. And that's amazing to me. Um, we focused a lot on the growth of the community around the workloads themselves, around the charms. We love contribution to Juju. You know, we, we, we welcome the help in terms of, of developing this project. But you know, if I if I were asked where do I really want you know the the the, the community growth and, and, and the force is it's behind the charms, behind these workloads, um, having the upstreams for these workloads take ownership of them and, and use them as a way to to promote their, their you know their applications because it's it is easier to install that way um, and you you have the benefit of being able you know once you once it's charmed it runs anywhere so you know maybe you want to run on AWS for a while then you know the the cloud public cloud prices change and you and you decide to switch it over to Google Compute you can do it that easily with Juju um, or, you know or maybe you you know your lab all of a sudden has a, a boost of hardware and you want to bring that stuff in house again you can do that without you know much change to how you deploy how you manage because it's already charmed uh, and, and that charm is is backed by the excellence of the upstream who knows how to run that given application that upstream could be commercial or or uh, open source in terms of uh, you know just a project um, we have a lot of contributions from from around the from, from around the entire ecosystem on that and it's pretty exciting to see that grow um, I'm mindful of the time here. I have about three minutes left. So I mean, what else are we covering in, in this cycle? Um, LexD, um, which is a, our focus on you know, container hypervisors. Some of you may have seen the announcements, you know, over the year, um, seen the various demos. Uh, Tycho Anderson gave us a pretty sweet demo uh, around <laughs> Doom and, and, and the migration of live workloads within uh, a LexD-based OpenStack deployment. Um, LexD. You know, runs beyond just OpenStack. Um, it is a way that we can run OpenStack. You know, depending upon what you want to do with that workload. Obviously, if you want to run Windows uh, clients in your OpenStack, you're, you're going to be more constrained to a VM approach. Um, but but if if your workloads are Linux based, LexD is probably the better way to go in terms of getting more you know bang for your buck in terms of the hardware and performance. Um, there's a show and tell, I believe, uh, where Tyco will uh, demo and show LexD in action. I have no idea what that demo is, uh, so I'll probably tune in myself just to check it out. Um, and then there's a lot of talk around Snappy. Um, I'm not going to go too far into it because I think Alexander did a great job. But it's also something that we've we've seen as a as a as a plus going into the cloud. Um, you know, transactional updates are very useful in the cloud in terms of you know being able to just kill a VM or roll it back and have the same exact deployment because you already have that encapsulated uh, a deployment in, in, a, in a container um, in a snap. Uh, Netflix is somebody who does this a lot, right? I mean they. They, they they get happy with the exact configuration they want, and they just redeploy, redeploy, redeploy. There's no you know app get updates or anything else going on in, in those environments, and that's something that uh, we've we've heard from the users in our in the cloud community of that with that's what they want. So Snappy really fit well in, into that into that model, um, and you know right now you know Snappy is it's 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 not where we would ultimately like would like it to be for the cloud. I mean obviously you can see the, the convergence of Juju and Snappy coming along where Juju's deploying snaps um, 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 in the sense of being able to have those transactional updates that Juju can drive. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a it's a natural evolution and obviously it's not a surprise that that, that will happen. Um, 
and uh, you know we welcome your feedback and your comments on, on how that should should that occur down the down the line. Um, uh, and then I guess finally, you know, let me wrap up with a minute left is around the community around server and cloud. I think. Uh, you know, for a while, there's always jokes that the community of you know server was pretty small, and and you know as, as the cloud evolved, it's like, well, you know, who is our community? But the community has actually kind of evolved and grown to to be you know users and contributors around cloud and scale out workloads. And the community is not just your individuals, but you know huge what we call corporations that are contributing directly into Ubuntu that are that are improving Ubuntu for the user, be it you know IBM, Deutsche Telekom, CloudBase, Docker. Um, and of course, all the millions of users on the cloud. So I, I think, um, you know, I, I'm pretty. It's pretty exciting to see where Ubuntu Server and Ubuntu Cloud have come from a community standpoint. Uh, the community has vastly grown. Um, and again, you know, if if you if you're interested in contributing to to any of these topics, please you know join the sessions. Um, you can find me on IRC, Robbie W. There. Uh, and um, yeah, just looking forward to this cycle. Uh, it's going to be pretty crazy. Obviously, Wiley Werewolf. Can't wait to see what the what the shirts are going to look like. <laughs> um, and that's it. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I know we got to start in about five minutes, so I'll hand it over to Michael. If there's any closing comments he has. All right. Well, I hope uh, that gave everybody a taste of what's going to be happening this week. So now go out, uh, find out where you want to be involved in Ubuntu, and sign up for those sessions and participate in them. I hope you all have a good week, and uh, we'll see you all again at the closing summaries uh, on Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you.